Hello, I'm Taj, digitally known as Tropic Vibes, the host of Nifty Business, where we highlight NFTs and explore Web 3.0 as we move from pure speculation to creating real world value. So on December 9th, 2021, Congress had a hearing with various CEOs of different Web3 companies. And I thought the conversation was very interesting as to what they were having, the questions that they were asking. There's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about what Web3 is and what's going on. I released an episode very early in the life of this show that really featured this discussion and everything that was happening during that hearing. However, it's very funny to me that a lot of the things that were covered in that topic during that discussion is still relevant today. There's a lot of misconceptions. People don't really understand what's going on, the difference between Web 1, 2, and 3. And of course, the lines are being blurred. The funny thing is, the deeper we go into Web 3, the more we're blurring the lines between Web 2 and 3, which is a very good thing because it is going to ease the onboarding for a lot of people. Because clearly by the discussion and what's going on in this, a lot of people that are making decisions and laws about what is going on in Web3 don't even understand what Web3 fully is. But I thought it would have been very beneficial to revisit this episode or that discussion as to what was going on in that time. And it really applies still today. Because if you ask the average person that is in NFTs or in crypto to really define what Web123 is, you'd get a very convoluted answer that really doesn't make sense. And it couldn't really be repeated in a way that is able to onboard anyone new into the space. So the reason why I'm going to discuss this and revisit this is because I think it's very beneficial to understand as we're onboarding the next generation of people coming into the space. Because during this quote unquote bear market, as I like to call, I always say quote unquote uh, market, there's a lot of people that are exiting the space and new people are coming in. And in order to not have all those bad habits and everything that really got us into a bad place during the first run, we would love to educate the people, really give them the understanding of the value of this space and not to just devalue it and just turn it into degen fest and crash everything all over again. We want to really understand and appreciate what's going on here. And I don't think there's a better way to do that than to educate the people that are coming into our various communities. Whether we are there or we're launching our own, this is a new project, I think it really is not just the founder's responsibilities, but for the people that have been in the space for a year or so that really have an understanding of this stuff, not to just understand it for themselves, but to be able to explain it and bring people in in a proper way. So this episode, I'm going to just revisit a few things because it's still timely and I think it is just very great and I'm pulling in that conversation with Congress and those CEOs once again. On December 9th, there was a congressional hearing between various members of Congress and the crypto leaders as far as CEOs from various companies and so forth. And they were asking questions and trying to really just educate Congress on their policy making as to what really is going on in the industry, what these terms mean, what is actually going on, the implications and the benefits and the various risks that are towards the general population. And they were just trying to help to educate them on the whole process because through this whole thing, obviously we know, and I've mentioned it many times, that Congress is trying to regulate something that they don't even fully understand. If you ever watch one of those congressional hearings when they're grilling Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook or any of the social media platform leaders, you can clearly understand they don't really understand the actual makeup of the internet, how things are going. So it's laughable to me when they're actually making these statements about a crypto, Web3, the NFT space and all this stuff because they honestly do not understand social media. So it, how on earth can they possibly regulate something that they don't understand. One of the more interesting parts of the whole discussion, I thought, was between North Carolina Representative Patrick McHenry and Brian Brooks, who is the CEO of Bitfury Group. And the questions that Representative McHenry was asking, I thought were very relevant, very important, really distinct, and really helping the panelists and the members of Congress to even understand the difference between Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. The entirety of the hearing was four hours, so I'm not going to go through four hours. What I'm just going to cut out is that one little section, which is about six minutes, and I think it just does a great breakdown. And I'll just dive in, give a little commentary afterwards, explaining how all of that ties into this whole NFT space. Space. Mr. Brooks, let's step back from digital assets and blockchain for a moment. Let's talk about where the internet was, where it's come to, where it's going, right? We're trying to level set here for policymakers. So originally, the internet was a read only format, in essence. We're consuming information. And then there's additional layers that we place on. 
it became much more interactive. But counterintuitively, much more interactive, but much more centralized in Web 1, Web 2. What we're hearing now is Web 3. Policymakers need to understand the nature of Web 3. This is a hearing about a component of Web 3. Now, along those lines, what are the characteristics that defined Web 1 and Web 2? Mr. McHenry, thank you very much for that question. I think that's critical to understanding what we're all trying to build here. <clears throat> so the characteristic of Web 1, if people remember their original AOL account, was an ability to look in a curated walled garden at a set of content that was not interactive but was presented to you on AOL the way that Time Magazine used to show you the articles they wanted you to see inside of their magazine. It's just you could see it on a screen. The innovation of Web 2 was that suddenly you could not only read content, but you could also write content. This is when the blogosphere became a, a big thing. People remember this from the late 90s, the early 2000s. The reason for the centralization of the internet, of course, was that all of that activity was being monetized by a very small number of companies. Facebook, as the chairwoman, as chairwoman mentions, Google, and two or three other companies. What makes Web3 different is the ability to own the actual network. And that's what crypto assets themselves represent, is an ownership stake in an underlying network. So when you hear people talk about, for example, layer one tokens, what they mean is, this is your reward for providing the ledger maintenance services, the computing power to the network that on web one and two was done by Google, right? So now people in my hometown of Pueblo, Colorado can actually own the Ethereum network, but they can't own the internet. That's owned by Google and a few other companies. That's what the project of crypto is all about, is allowing people to directly own the networks that are, have native assets that are supporting it, and that's the nature of decentralization, where the token holders are the people who control the assets, okay, not so the Google. Token holders, for, for our language here on the Hill, those are digital assets, right, which are the keys to open up the ledger for you to participate, right? Correct. So describe to us how those digital assets fit into this internet revolution, Web3. So the concept is that you have sort of application layer tokens and you have protocol layer tokens. So if I'm an owner of Bitcoin, let's say that I'm a miner of Bitcoin, somebody who actually creates Bitcoin. The Bitcoin is the reward I receive for doing the work to keep the network operational. And that allows me to own a piece of the Bitcoin blockchain. Or take Ethereum, which is easier to understand. The Ether token represents an ownership stake in the network but on top of that network are all kinds of apps that get built on the network, much like the apps on your phone depend on the underlying network existing that lets the phone operate. And so people will make judgments about which network is likely to win, and they will invest in the tokens in that network much the same way you might invest in Google stock because you think Google is going to scale access to the original internet. The difference being here, you can vote on what happens in the future of a proof of stake network, for example. You can get rewarded through a proof of work token for maintaining a ledger on something like Bitcoin. But the real message here is that what happens on the decentralized internet is decided by the investors versus what happens on the main internet is decided by Twitter, Facebook, Google, and a small number of other companies. Okay, so getting this, this layer of, on digital assets right, for Congress to understand this, Everything is built upon that, uh, that, uh, that uh, on-ramp to this new internet. So very important for us to be sensitive to how this de develops and any actions we take in terms of uh, laws and, and updating laws to incorporate these new technologies. Yeah, it, Mr. McHenry couldn't agree more. And, and I think when you hear about all of the problems of different big tech companies, the importance of an owner-controlled network becomes clear. Okay, owner-controlled network rather than a cooperative, right? And, yes. and thinking in those terms, Absolutely. right? So if you're not a part of management, you're not making a decision in Web 2. If you are a participant in the network, you're, you're, making, uh, you're cooperating in the making of those decisions. E exactly right. Okay. So I ask this not to be insulting to the panel, but to have a level set here so we have an understanding of what we're talking about. This is not simply about you on this panel, it is about trillions of dollars of assets that did not exist before Satoshi wrote his white paper 13 years ago. It's about $3 trillion in, in notional value at this stage around the development of a whole new range, whole new suite of technology 
that will be developed across the globe, whether or not the United States embraces it and wants to compete, or if it's pushed offshore. So as policymakers, we need to understand what we're talking about here. This is a small panel, important as you may be, a small panel about the discussion about Web3. And so with that, Madam Chair, thank you uh, for having this hearing, and I hope that we can have more understanding by policymakers about these important concepts. Thank you, Mr. Yes, that was Brian Brooks, and he's the CEO of Bitfury, and I thought his answer was just great. I thought the questioning in that section was actually very good, but more so the answers. Very easy to understand, very straightforward, and I think it's very relevant to what we're doing in this NFT space in the sense that when he says that as the token holders, you're not only participating in the network, but you're also an owner of the network. And I think that also on a very micro scale in various NFT projects, when you buy into these communities and you're actually on it and it, whether or not you're in a DAO, they give you a participation as to which direction the project goes. And a lot of this takes place on Discord and it might not be in a formal vote per se, but various holders of the NFTs do have input. And I think that is just a very distinct part of Web3 and what's going on in this NFT space because definitely in YouTube land or social media land as far as Twitter or Facebook or any of them, you know, what when you're a content creator or you're a consumer of that, all you can really do is consume, you can watch, you can participate and hit likes, but really you have no direction or no input into the content. And sure, you can voice your opinion, but no one, whether it be the creator or the platform, has to really care or listen to say any extent as to what you think. So I think that is a very distinct part about Web3 and I think it's very cool. And if you watch the rest of the hearing, which I know it's extremely long, I'm probably one of the very few people who could stomach going through all of this because I just find it so interesting what have you. But if you look in the show notes, I'll leave the links to the sections where Brian Brooks is answering to the questioning by Congress. And I think that is just really cool. His input, his insight. Actually, I was not even very familiar with him before, but now definitely I'm going to have to go try to track him down on Twitter and definitely follow him because the way he answered these questions, the way he just made everything sound so simple. I think it was just great as for educating your friends or whoever it is might be in this space. If you just watch those segments that he actually breaks it down and explains it to Congress, because if you can get Congress to understand it, I'm pretty sure you can get any of your friends and family members to really understand this whole Web3 space and what is going on. And his sections that I'm going to just put the timestamps for if you want to skip through on the video on YouTube, I'll leave the link for that and so you don't have to sit there and watch the full four hours. However, various people that were in there, there were some great answers given, but I just put the highlight really on his segment. So I'd love to know what you're thinking, how you thought his answers were as far as this whole thing and where we are on the ground floor of Web3 and with everything going on going on this NFT space, how it really ties into everything, cryptocurrencies, Web3, NFTs. It's all one big happy family over here and that not only are we putting our money in and time into this space, but we're actually, as members and participants in the community, we're helping to build it. So it's just exciting times and I'm happy to be on this journey with you as usual. I will see you in the next one. Later. The Nifty Business Show is not investment advice. It provides insights and information within the space. As with anything, please do your own research before making a decision whether you're making an investment or a purchase.